sixth and final Sunday of this year's Epiphany is from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, the fifth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, You shall not murder. And whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable for judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to court with him, or your accuser may hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you will be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at woman with lust has already committed adultery, with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it up and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that anyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of unchastity, causes her to commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your word be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. And this is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to Christ. Please be seated. Brothers and sisters in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Here again are the words of the psalmist. Happy are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen.
something to the point of you will be in so much debt. And he's talking about God. You're going to be in so much debt that you'll be in jail forever. And there's no way then to pay your debt. Kind of scary. Kind of scary stuff. Which is why Martin Luther was driven to despair. At the time of the Reformation, he had bought into the notion, as most people had, all Christians had bought into this notion, that unless you lived a perfectly blameless life, you were doomed to hell. And if you didn't go and take communion often, and you didn't go to church, and you didn't pay money to the church, I mean, that was all kind of a threefold thing, then you were in deep trouble with God. Not the church people, but with God. And he would, he had, he had a depressive disorder, and he would think, okay, I will, I'm going home, or I'm going to church, and I haven't had communion today, and I'm going to get struck by lightning and die, do I then go to hell, because I was thinking a bad thought. And you hear how this would just consume people? If you're a perfectionist and things aren't lined up quite right, the first thing you need to do is straighten it out. There's a house here in Carroll that was just built, and one of the pillars on the back of the deck is off. You can see it as you drive down the road. I just want to go to those people and say, look at that builder back here and make that plumb and not off. I mean, I'm talking about a $300,000 house, and I wouldn't have accepted it at all because and then I think they can't probably see it from the deck. You can only see it from the road. And that's how sin happens. But then Jesus says something interesting, and this is what I really want to talk to you about today. He says, if you come to offer you a gift, but someone's angry with you, or you are angry with someone, I love this part, leave your gift. Now walk away with your gift. Leave your gift. But go and reconcile with that loved one or that person in your life. And I think how often are we holding grudges? How often are we angry with someone? Um, the other day on Facebook there was there was one of those where you click on it, it a little click baby, but not too bad, but it was 33 instances of revenge against someone you felt had wronged you. And here these people had been plotting and planning this revenge. And I'm thinking that whole time you were giving rent <coughs> to the person you're angry with in your head. When you are constantly consumed by your anger towards someone or some situation, you are giving them a free ride in your head, and it keeps you from fully enjoying <coughs> God's love and mercy for you. And when you're angry with someone, and can't seem to get over the hurdle of forgiving them, then you are blocking the love that can be happening for them through God. It's an interesting thing. Jesus says further on in this Sermon on the Mount, he says, if you don't forgive, your Father in Heaven will not forgive you. Those are scary words when you think about it. If you don't forgive, you're unforgiven. In Matthew 18, we talk about binding and loosing. If you bind on earth, that will be bound in heaven. So if you're holding on to a grudge or anger or resentment, that will follow you until you release it. Because it then goes on to say what you loosen will be loosed in heaven. So how we live our life here on the planet, looking to love one another and help one another and be kind to one another and trust in God's providence and God's work within our heart through Jesus, then we prosper. And so often we like to think, oh, well what Moses is talking about in Deuteronomy is that if we choose to follow God, we'll all be prosperous as in have money and a second car and 
says, my peace I give you, not as the world gives. We look at peace as the absence of conflict, and that is what it is. But also, it's a peace that you know that God's got this. One of my favorite sayings is God isn't sitting on the cloud somewhere saying, oh my sake, what am I going to do? He's always here for us in our darkest moments. If you have someone who you are having a problem with, ask God to help you through it. That's what the Holy Spirit is all about. If we were to expect our own good works to get us into heaven, we wouldn't have needed Jesus, would have we? So that's how that works. When we trust in God and follow his decrees, then things line up. And all of God's Ten Commandments line up in two ways. One focuses on God, the other focuses on neighbor. What are the two great commandments? Love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. It goes back to that joy. Jesus others and yourself. And if we do the no other gods, honor God, watch our mouths, and then don't think murderous thoughts, don't steal, don't lie, don't cheat on your spouse. And I would say that goes even further, don't cheat on your employer, don't cheat on your friends, don't cheat on yourself, don't cheat on anything. <coughs> Following the big two, which is love God, love neighbor, and yourself, we then can live in peace and prosperity. I can guarantee you all the angst in the world today is because we're not doing those two things. We want somebody else's oil. We want somebody else's land. We want somebody else's money. We want somebody else's, um, what do you want, you know? We want food cheaply, but we don't want to pay for the, for the workers that come across the border. To, <coughs> because if we were to pay a decent salary, we'd have to pay more at this grocery store, wouldn't we? But we don't want to do that because we want to keep our money in our pockets. In 1954, the word in God we trust, the phrase in God we trust was put on our money because we weren't going to be those communists in Russia, in the Soviet Union, it was strictly that. We're the God-fearing, God-loving country. They're the heathens. See, we're already we're not loving God and others, are we? But do we really trust God or do we trust what it's printed on? Do we trust our money? Do we trust our finances? And Jesus is saying that isn't going to work. Whenever we miss the mark, which is what sin means, it's an archery term. You hold the, the bow and you pull back the arrow and you're going to release it and hope to hit the bullseye. And I have found if you keep your eye on the bullseye, you have a better chance. Same with baseball. If you want to catch a ball, don't look at the glove. What do you look at? The baseball. And you let it go. And if you miss the bullseye, you have committed sin. That's the word. It's an archery term. It means you miss the mark. And so when we sin, we are missing the mark that is focusing on God. When we take our focus off of God, then suddenly we put our focus on something else, but not God. So we hang tight to that. Today, Eric and Katie are obedient to God's word to bring their children to the Lord. They're bringing little Addison to the pond where she will get really cold water. I found out two weeks ago. It's only 52 degrees. Did you know that Carol water is 52 degrees when it comes out of the ground? So that water is cold. And we're going to put it on her head in the name of Jesus in the name of God and in the name of the Spirit because Jesus told us to do that. His last words to us 
prosper to go and tell and preach and teach and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit, and remember. And we will remember today in Holy Communion. We will remember that Jesus gave himself to us and that when we come forward, we are receiving the body and blood of Jesus and remembering one more time to whom we belong and to what is important and what we need to stop worrying about and what we need to do. Keep short accounts. You don't have to hire an accountant if you don't have your own accounts. Forgive one another. Trust God to help flip your heart so that that forgiving action is palatable to you. Stop looking at what is fair and what is right that helps you and look more at the big picture of God's understanding of fairness, which is we all blew it. We all are deserving of hell, but Jesus, the one perfect person on the planet, died for us so that we can right with God. It's one of the most unfair transactions I've ever heard. When you think about it, that one came and died for all of us, past, present, and future, so that we may have eternal life with the creator of the universe. And that comes out because we're so wonderful. But in spite of it, God loves you, and God loves me, and God loves the whole cosmos. Thanks be to God for this love. Thanks be to God for the possibility of reconciliation. Now, one little word. If the person you need to reconcile with is toxic or dangerous, please don't go there. Write a letter. Pray to God. But if it's just, if I'm uncomfortable talking to this person, get your bones over and get it fixed up. <laughs> you know the difference. You know the difference. AA has a wonderful saying, we make amends for what we've done. That's, that's, that's our part. We make amends. And then we pray for the forgiveness to come back to us. Circular. Trust God, love God, love others, love yourself, and hold tight to these promises because you are beloved by the creator of the universe.